I grew up in Ohio in the 70s. Me and my childhood friend Joe were outside all the time. Joe lived on a farm that bordered a pretty big forest and my parents would drop me off in the morning and we'd stay in the woods all weekend. We loved pretending to be frontiersmen. We'd build shelters, traps, practice making fire with sticks, the whole nine yards. When we got to be in high school, we got this notion to pull a stand by me. This was based on a movie of the same name that had just come out. The idea was that we would walk the railroad tracks out into the country, but instead of looking for a dead body, we'd find a cool bridge to fish from and camp a little ways off the tracks. Of course, we knew this was dangerous and we'd likely to be trespassing, but we were just kids. We had a lot of fun. We found beautiful rivers. We discovered bridges no one went to fish and hid from trains at night. We camped in the woods just near the tracks and made small hidden fires. Nothing bad ever happened. In fact, it was so fun that we did it multiple times and never had a problem. After high school, me and Joe went our separate ways. We both left home, but always stayed in touch and always tried to coordinate visits so we'd see each other occasionally. One summer in the mid-90s, it worked out that we were both in town for about a week to do some family stuff. In the day and then at night, we could catch a drink and sit at a bar outside Joe's house around a fire and talk about the old days. One night, Joe and me got to talking about our standby me trips. Well, nostalgia and beer are a heck of a mix. And soon we decided to take a day walk to the rails and camp for a night and then walk back home. We started out early in the morning. We had my wife drop us off in our old spot where we used to start, right outside our hometown. She thought this was absolutely crazy and made sure to mention it when she pulled away. Joe suggested that we... Instead of walking the usual route, we'd just take the opposite direction and be adventurous. We knew the land well and we had a map, so off we set. The day went fine. It was fun and a little sad, but in a good way. We found a bridge and sat on the edge for a bit and then we moved on. We had no fishing gear, but we brought some canned food and other stuff. Before the night started to set in, we picked a spot to camp. It was a thick forested area, trees on either side of the train tracks and you felt like you were in a tunnel. We brought small hammocks to sleep on, but before we set them up, we decided to do a little scouting of the perimeter. Now, this is what we used to do in the olden days too. We'd walk around the area a little bit to make sure that some dude's house wasn't just over a hill and we weren't actually camping in their yard. We walked maybe a hundred feet or so into the woods up a small incline. We figured if we didn't see anything from on top of this short hill, we'd be fine. When we got to the top, we saw an old building down at the bottom about a hundred yards into the woods. It was barely visible. We pondered over what we should do, both assuming it was a sugar shack or something, but there didn't seem to be a clear road into it, and from where we were, it didn't seem to be look like there was anyone in there either. All was quiet and there was no movement that could be seen. No lights. We decided to take a little walk closer just to make sure. We came down the hill very slowly, and as we neared the building... We saw it wasn't a sugar shack at all, but in fact it was an old church. It looked like it had been abandoned for years. It was a squat sagging building whose wooden planks were almost black from years of moss and rot. The cross still stood on top of the place, also weathered black. None of the windows had glass and there were no doors, just open doorways. We got close enough to see inside and there were rows of pews and a section in front for the preacher to stand. We didn't go all the way in. We didn't want to. Beyond all that, there was no sign of anyone else. No footprints, no paths, and no roads. It was just an old, abandoned church. We left immediately and went back up the hill to our spot where we picked camp. Having a hill between us and the church made us feel better, but we were still a little bit uneasy. We chalked it up to the natural creepiness that seeing a church in the middle of the woods would elicit. Besides, at that point, it was dusk, and we had just decided to rig up our hammocks and go to sleep and move on early in the morning. Night set in, and as we laid in our hammocks and talked, we began to hear something in the direction of the church. Our conversation about it went a little like this. Hey, do you hear that? Yeah, what the heck is that? Sounds like people singing. We both slid out out of our hammocks and hunkered down, straining to hear more. We listened for a minute or two and the singing continued, but it wasn't getting louder. We finally decided to creep back up the hill and see if we could spy where the sound was coming from. We could still move very quietly in the woods from the old days. It was second nature to us. 
The moon was barely out, but it provided enough light so you wouldn't need to walk into a tree, but it was still near pitch black. We didn't use our flashlights as we crept slowly up the hill, and we didn't talk either. When we got to the top, we saw light in the distance. It was coming from the church, and the singing was coming from inside. Joe and I put our heads close together and had a hushed conversation that boiled down to, Can you believe this? The light looked to be candle lit from the way it flickered, and though we tried, we couldn't make out what was being sung. It sounded like church music, but in another language. We sat and watched for a while, trying to see who was in there, but we only saw occasional shadows. We had no intention of getting closer either. We had about a football field length between us, and we aimed to keep it that way. The singing continued for a bit, and then it stopped. After that, a booming male voice began to chant. I was already freaked out, but this voice thoroughly scared the crap out of me. It sounded like some Old Testament preacher you see in the movies, but again, it was like he was speaking in a different language, because we couldn't understand a single word. Eventually, it got to where the single male voice would say something, and then a bunch of voices would answer in song. This lasted for a while, and then they all broke into this long, sustained wail that just kept getting louder and louder, and it got so loud and disturbing that I had to cover my ears, and then it just abruptly stopped. At this point, I was just getting ready to say, let's get the heck out of here, when Joe put a hand on my shoulder and hissed, they're coming out. We were too far away, so we couldn't really make out what they were wearing or who they were very well, but what we could see was a line of figures walk out the open doorway, all holding hands in single file. We could see some of them had flashlights and they began to sing again, and the light from the flashlights began to move towards us in the hill. We booked it back down to our campsite, grabbed our stuff and ran to the tracks. Once there, we ran down the tracks in the direction that we came from. After a few minutes, we stopped and looked back and we saw lights coming from the hill. They were moving erratically, like whoever was holding them were shaking them. We continued to run in spurts and walk as fast as we could. We eventually stopped seeing the lights and came to a small road. From our map, we knew that a small town was about 15 minutes away. So we walked there and got to a 24-hour gas station, and I called my wife to come and get us. My wife and other friends just thought it was kids messing around, but I definitely heard those voices, and I definitely didn't think they sounded like kids to me. I'm not sure who those people were, but it definitely was the creepiest thing that has ever happened to me out there in those woods. For some context, I am male in this story. I have been camping, solo backpacking and hunting my whole life in Oregon and felt comfortable in the woods and I have a deep respect for nature. A few years ago I took my wife, daughter and two German shepherds camping just north of Mount Jefferson, Oregon. Found a campsite which seemed to be perfect setup for us and our two dogs who need the privacy since they are intimidating to other dog owners and can be quite loud when spooked. It was not an established campsite just a nice horseshoe off of the USFS road that had flat ground full of trees and a fire pit. First night, my daughter wanted to sleep by herself in a two-man tent, feet away from ours. It was maybe two feet from me and my wife's tent. We made our two German shepherds sleep with her in her tent. That whole first night, my wife and I heard footsteps and they sounded heavy, not like typical forest critters scampering around at night. I was well armed because I was paranoid from reading recently about a dad in California who was shot and killed in a tent next to his own two daughters. Needless to say, my wife and I had two pistols, my rifle and the dogs. Dogs are great at detection and that's why I felt comfortable with my daughter sleeping alone because our two dogs are completely fearless and nothing would lay a hand on her without a battle to the death. All in all, nothing but bad vibes and loud footsteps occurred that night. The next morning we went for a walk down the road about 300 feet away. I saw an abandoned road where a rusted gate post was covered in vegetation. Something of a blue colour caught my eye and Guts, my dog, immediately took off running down the road. My heart began to race because I assumed it was just another family camping like us and he was going to get himself shot or scare some innocent people to death. So I chased after him as fast as I could. He finally stopped on the road about maybe 20 feet away but I covered just enough distance to see that there was nobody there. Something felt off about this sight. I yelled, hello, is anyone there? Sorry about my dog. I got no response. My curiosity often gets the best of me, so I had to see what the sight conditions were, a 
and as I got closer I knew something was wrong. It had all the necessities for a campsite, including a cooler, propane burner, tent, blankets and folding table, but every single item had been completely destroyed, smashed and torn. We all walked around in circles, puzzled why anyone would leave all their camping gear behind, including an expensive REI-10. I figured that someone left in a hurry and the animals got the rest. It was the only logical explanation. Still, the propane tank and cooler were flattened by something and it certainly wasn't a snowpack with tree coverage in that spot. As the afternoon rolled in, my daughter and I were playing bocce ball at the campsite when my wife yelled that Guts was running away. Normally he would always be with me unless he was called over and she didn't call for him. His speed and focus caught my attention and I knew something weird was happening so I ran over there and my wife started jogging towards me. I immediately drew my pistol. Guts continued running into the forest another hundred feet before I called him and he stopped. My other dog, who never misses the opportunity to be the pack leader, was not taking point. I have had her for seven years now and this was the first time in her life she refused to leave my daughter's side. Her hair was completely raised. I asked my wife what had happened and she said that I was trying to pee and all of a sudden I got this feeling that someone was watching me and, and then I saw Guts just running towards me so I got up to move towards you. We spent another 10 minutes looking for signs of anything but we saw no trails or broken branches, nothing to the point where it went. So we decided to spend one more night since it was too late to pack up and then drive back. We all stayed in the same tent. Before we went to bed I put a rope with a makeshift coin alarm around the perimeter of the campsite. I used a mint can and some coins and keys from our truck and zip tied it so anything hitting the rope would give a little jingle. I hung it up a few feet off the ground. It was very unsophisticated but it was enough to put my wife at ease. As I was sleeping I awoke to hear the dogs growling. I listened for a minute and heard a faint jingling sound coming from where I'd placed my makeshift alarm system. I was sick of it so I opened the tent and I fired a shot from my 45 into the dirt to warn anyone who was watching us that we were armed. That was when I heard footsteps running off in the distance. I have enough camping experience to know with certainty that those footsteps did not come from any animal. The dogs were going crazy now, barking and growling. I reassured my wife and daughter that whoever it was now knows that we are armed and have two wolves. So we were a risky target and now they can sleep safely. For the rest of the night we didn't hear any more footsteps and the dog never perked up or barked once. We left early in the morning and fast forward to today I watched the Amazon Missing 411 Hunted documentary and I noticed that it was in the same area we had camped at that weekend. A flood of dread rushed over me as I thought about that mysterious abandoned campsite. Someone was actually kidnapped 300 feet away from where we camped. We're all very thankful that we made it out safe that weekend. First off, I love to camp. I've been doing it my whole life and I've never had a scary experience until this past summer. My boyfriend and I decided to go out to the gorge for some quality time camping. We had always gone with other people but this time was the first time it would just be us two. When we got out of the car to prep our gear for the mile hike back to the camping spot, two sketchy looking dudes came out of their trailhead, I does, and went on to their old school WV camper van. I had a weird feeling but shrugged it off and proceeded back to our camping spot. I had previously camped in the same area a handful of times and I know it pretty well. Once we got back there, I knew a handful of different camping spots and proceeded to check them all out for us, for the ideal one. I noticed what looked like someone camping further up the hill, so I picked a spot a little further down, where we'd mostly be out of sight. It was starting to get dark by the time we got everything set up, so I figured I'd start looking for some firewood. And then suddenly, this guy appears out of nowhere, asks us if we'd like any help, and offered to sell us a bundle of firewood for ten bucks. I laughed because we were in the woods, thus surrounded by wood which I could pick up off the ground for free. He then said I wouldn't find much wood because they'd already cleared it out over the past few weeks. Few weeks? I asked him. How long have you been camping up here? Oh, for about a little bit over a month, he replied. Which I found strange because the longest anyone can camp in this area in the National Forest is two weeks. I already had the creeps about him and he claimed he was up there by himself. I asked him why I heard him yelling with someone then and why he referred to more people when talking about the wood. He stammered and was like, uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, well, there's some dudes I know camping over up there or over the other side of the river. Then he proceeds to tell us that he's been lonely since arriving. He was from Pennsylvania, took a bus to Lexington, Kentucky and had been living in the woods back 
behind where I currently work. I knew exactly where he was talking about because I see a lot of homeless people, immigrants and drug addicts coming in and out of those woods every day. From what I gathered, he was basically a homeless person who had somehow got a ride out to the gorge and decided he would just live there instead. He had been living on snakes, bugs and selling firewood for food. He said we were the first people he'd seen in weeks. His stories were all over the place and I knew he was lying about a lot of what he told us. He definitely wasn't alone, even though he claimed to be. He even took us up to his camp where there was tons of stuff for several guys, not just one. He said he liked camping up top where he could see everything and everyone. By now it was getting dark and he helped us get a fire going. I was trying to politely get him back on his way up the hill so I could just have a minute to process all of this. When he left, I started whispering to my boyfriend that there was no way I could sleep with that sketchy, creepy guy right up the hill. We didn't even have a knife or a gun or even a dog to protect ourselves with if we needed to. I quietly said let's get all of our stuff together and get the hell out of here. We did, but we left our new tarp set up because it would make too much noise and he'd know we were leaving. To confirm my suspicions, I glanced up the hill and I saw silhouettes of at least three people inside through the closed blinds. As soon as I stood up with my pack ready to get out of Dodge, he came out and yelled, How's it going down there? And we proceeded to get out as quickly and as quietly as possible. In my mind, we were either going to get robbed, killed or something else because he was not alone. His stories didn't add up and his background of where he came from made me believe he was running away from something and was trying to hide by living off the grid. I called the rangers the next day and told them about him. Luckily, all he got from us was a new set of tarps. <laughs>